Hello, Cassie and Rusty. Welcome to Autism Knows No Borders. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Rachel. Pleasure to have you on this podcast. Thanks so much for having us, Rachel. You've both been requested by our listeners to be guests on the show. A lot of our Skill Corps alumni have met you both, either at orientation or at least seen you around the office, so they'll be happy to hear from you. Let's start with some brief introductions. Please share how you got involved with the Global Autism Project and what different roles you've had in the organization since then. Cassie, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, I started with the Global Autism Project um, in 2013 when I applied to be a Skill Corps member. Um, back then, I think there were under 50 people that had ever been a part of the program, which at the time I thought that was huge. Um, so. I applied in October, got accepted, um, I think in November, and then I fundraised for quite some time and then traveled in July the next year. Um, I was supposed to go to Indonesia. I instead was sent to India, which amazingly kind of shaped the future of my life, that kind of <laughs> accidental shift in where I was supposed to go. Um yeah, and I got my my journey with the Global Autism Project started there with a Skill Corps trip to India. Um, I then moved to Australia for a bit, and from there, I I traveled with Skill Corps again to Indonesia because it was very close. Um, and then I flew back whenever I got the opportunity to go to Leadership Academy, and I came back. I said, "Hey, Molly, I'm unemployed. I just moved back to America. Don't you want to give me a job?" And she kind of laughed and said, maybe. <laughs> and then a couple months later, she really needed someone to travel again and be a trip leader and uh, be a trip leader over and over and over again. So I said, hey, that's me. And she uh, she offered me the, the spot to kind of step in and be a almost full-time Skill Corps trip leader. I was going on a trip every few weeks to to one of our partner sites. Wow. Um, and at the time we had four partner sites. Now we have, you know, over 15, I think. And so it's been, um, I've watched the growth and the, the change with Global Autism Project and, and kind of through that journey, I've stepped into a lot of different roles, but now I'm in the uh, director of outreach role. Uh, and I play a big part in um, just the the voice and the communication and the storytelling and the connection piece of our work um, and helping our partners all over the world uh, do the same thing, engage their community, talk about autism, um, talk about services and create some awareness and understanding in, in their part of the world. Cool. Yeah. And Cassie, the Global Autism Project would not be what it is today without you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I've, I mean, I've loved getting to play that play that big role and kind of be one of, I always say I'm one of the first followers, one mm -hmm. of the early people that stepped in and it's been powerful to watch it grow over the years. Great. Rusty, how about you? I, I, I got involved with the Global Autism Project through the nonprofit employment agency Job Path in Midtown Manhattan. And I first met founder and CEO Molly Olapini at a paddle for autism awareness at Louis Valentino Jr. Park in Red Hook, Brooklyn back in 2009, and I paddled to help raise money for people with autism throughout the world. And I figured that the Paddle for Autism Awareness in 2009 would want me to get involved more with the Global Autism Project. And I took eight paddles for autism awareness trips, four in Red Hook, Brooklyn, one in LA, one in Phoenix, one in Boston, and one in San Francisco. And I started joining skill, deciding to apply for Skill Corps in 2013 so that I could travel to Peru and translate for the behavior therapists, speech therapists, occupational therapists, psychiatrists, psychologists, and social workers in Lima at a center. Two years after traveling to Peru, and I got to go on the Gilcore trip to the Dominican Republic, and I got to translate for the behavior therapists, speech therapists, occupational therapists, psychiatrists, psychologists, and social workers in, at the center in Dominican, in Santo Domingo. And I also did a talk at, you know, the Catholic University of Santo Domingo and Nibion, what it was like to be an individual on the autism spectrum. I mean, before I was first diagnosed with autism, I would I actually taught myself to read at the age of 18 months. Wow. And 
Well, and as an individual with autism, I was able to get a certificate in the Arabic language from NYU. And I was able to, besides doing, and I've been able to use Spanish and Arabic translations for the Global Autism Project's partner sites. I even did some oral and written Arabic translations for the Saudi Arabia partner site. And as an individual on the autism spectrum, I mean, in well, in 2004, the New York City Department of Education said that I wasn't eligible to graduate with a Regents Diploma, but in 2005, they were wrong. And then, then I retrieved my hidden Regents Diploma. And like not that many people on the autism spectrum in New York State and parts of California do, I ended up graduating with a Regents Diploma back in uh, 2000. I, I graduated in June 2004 with a Regents Diploma from the Manhattan Center for Science and Mathematics in East Harlem. But problem was that my Regents Diploma was, was hidden, so I had to retrieve my hidden Regents, Regents Diploma one year later. Mm. And also, let's see, you know, I, I was also, I pr- took courses at the Vocational Independence Program at, in the now, now defunct Vocational Independence Program at NYT's old Central Islip campus. Mm-hmm. And, well, the Central Islip campus is now for sale, but before it was for sale, I, I did a lot of classes on, like, I worked on, like, vocational skill, career planning, budgeting, and socialization and things like that. And, and, and I also got involved through Special Citizens Futures Unlimited. That's a su- ha- supported housing agency for people with disabilities throughout New York State. And they helped me with cooking, cooking, budgeting, stress management, time management. And I feel that the business classes in the vocational independence program really got me to where I am right now at the Global Autism Project. And and it really helped me get my certificate in the Arabic language from NYU because without the business classes and the vocational independence program, without taking them, who knows where I would be right now. But I'm glad I'm where I am where I am. And I'm blessed that I got to become an official paid employee for the Global Autism Project five years ago. Because I had started out as a volunteer and I figured, you know, that many volunteers end up becoming paid employees after certain time periods. Yeah, that was the same as as me, Rusty. And we, we started at the same time as paid paid employees. We both started as volunteers for a couple of years. And, you know, I moved into New York, obviously, and we started in the office as paid employees at the same time. So we're kind of on the same, uh, same track, really, with our career. And that's great, Cassie. Yeah. What kind of work were you doing for the Global Autism Project as a paid employee, Rusty? Oh, databases and spreadsheets, re- rearranging the shelves, putting, setting up sweatshirts for the skill core orientations, showing the skill core orientation members around New York City and New York State, telling them all about my trips, asking them where they traveled outside the United States and Canada. Also, getting to know some of them outside of work and at, but and to knowing more about their professional lives outside of the Global Autism Project. Like I visited Sarah back when she was in Ohio, living in Ohio, Sarah Glass. And I visited Marina in California. Marina's a speech therapist. And Marina and I did the bus tour of Yosemite National Park. And Sarah and I visited the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Cuyahoga Valley National Park and a whole bunch of places in Ohio. So what have you both liked about working with the Global Autism Project? Who's going to go first, me or you, Cassie? You can go first this time, Rusty. So what I really like about the Global Autism Project is that I like helping people out during times of crises, like natural disasters, global pandemics. And I also really like to find purposeful things to contribute to society because because I know when I'm helping people, you really make a difference because with these autism podcasts, they can really help people in poor underdeveloped countries where there's like limited services for individuals on the autism spectrum, like limited education, especially in countries that rely mostly on other businesses and industries like Guinea-Bissau, which relies mostly on like fishing and agriculture, like coffee plantations and, and rice farms and things like that. Mm-hmm. And also this can with this can also like help like people on the autism spectrum who have like issues with language barriers keep develop fluencies in in other languages so that they can not so they can actually de- defeat the language barriers and so that way sometimes in that way their parents don't lose custody over their children if, if they can't find translators because sometimes with language barriers like there are a lot of children on the autism spectrum whose parents can lose custody of them because they can't find translators. Oh, I didn't even think about that. Cassie, why are you passionate about this work? Um, 
there's so much to be passionate about in this work. It's, um, you know, I think for me, it boils down to kind of two things, the people, uh, just the global community of people that are um, a part of this, this work, uh, from half my colleagues with autism to the partners we work with around the world that are some of the first and only advocates in their community. Um, it's just really the people that work here, the people that volunteer here, the people that support this work are just a unique group of people. And it's, it's a really powerful community to be a part of. And, and it's a beautiful group of people to connect with. And I think, you know, through everything we're going through right now with the pandemic and just all of the challenges of the world, it's been really nice to have a global community of people to connect with and check in on. I've had people from, you know, a friend from Uganda reached out to me yesterday, just asking how things are. And a few days ago, I talked to a friend in India asking how things are. And um, it's just, it's nice to know that I work in a place that is made up of hundreds and thousands of, of people that are just as passionate as I am. And we all care about each other so much. So I think the people is, is one part. And I think the other part for me is the scale of impact. Um, I think, you know, for Rusty and I, Rusty plays a big role in kind of helping me with the event planning side of things. Um, from, you know, rolling sweatshirts, he and I are back there rolling sweatshirts before orientation and um, setting out snacks and filling up water bottles and things that could seemingly be meaningless projects and tasks that we do three times a year. And, you know, it, it's not necessarily the most exciting work on those days. Um, but we're, there's a whole group of us back there doing it. We know at the end of the day, those water bottles are for skill core members who are going out into the world to, to provide training and support and empower parents and engage in conversations that have to be had out, out in the world. And, we may be feeding them snacks for those two days, but it's um, we know the impact we're making in every every minute of the work that we're doing, and I think that's that's something you can't get everywhere. Mm -hmm. We get it at the Global Autism Project. Yeah, you were both working at our Brooklyn office. Well, Cassie, until you moved to South Carolina last year, and Rusty until we had to close the office in March due to the pandemic. Could you share some fun stories about office life when you were both still there? Oh, Cassie, like with office life, we would we would celebrate birthdays. We would put like decorations all the way up on the ceilings and decorations all the way from like top to bottom, side to side. Mm -hmm. And oh, it's for everyone's birthday too. We'd get to a point, yeah, where. We we had so many people that started working our team grew. It used to be kind of like me, Molly, Rusty, a handful of other people. And, and then our team grew, we had big groups of interns. And then we started having to do monthly birthday celebrations because we had so many, so many people. So Rusty played your role, I guess, mainly Rusty was like playing the music and, and picking out kind of the theme for the party, right? Yeah, sure, sure was Cassie. Yeah, <laughs> Th those days were definitely helpful. That was def those were moments were de are definitely worth reliving, and they're definitely helpful too. They're definitely yeah. helpful moments. I yeah. know it was so much fun. We had yes, yeah, so we took birthdays very seriously. We still do. We've had some Zoom birthday parties <laughs> since <laughs> since all of this has happened. Um, and yeah, Rusty, you did the music that day, so we all played our played our roles. I think um, everyone had a. A different thing that they had to do for the birthdays and I often did the decorating and, and <laughs> rounding everybody up. Um so birthday parties were, were a birthday ton of bonanza, fun in the right? Yeah, it's a birthday bonanza. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so we took those pretty serious. And then if people had a big one, we may even go out and go to Shake Shack or somewhere somewhere walk a few blocks down, get ice cream. Um I think that's that's another thing that comes to mind is um for the people listening, I don't know if this is public knowledge, but Molly, our founder and CEO, eats more ice cream than any person <laughs> I've ever known to, to eat ice cream. I will second that because she's eaten it when it's been freezing cold, too, when yes. we were in Long Island. 
Yeah. Yes. And sometimes we would go over and they would give out free ice cream if the temperature was below freezing. And she was like, we have to go get ice cream today. <laughs> um, but she would come out of her office and say, everybody stop what you're doing. Stop what you're doing. What are you working on? We're going to get ice cream. <laughs> and we'd all as, I mean, all the interns, everybody working, you'd finish whatever it was you're doing. And we'd go walk a block down and go get ice cream and sit on the roof or sit there together and just kind of have a, have an ice cream break. That was a really fun part of office life. Yeah. I like going to Ample Hills Creamery Ice Cream. It was wonderful when we went, Cassie, after the successful skill core orientations. And so let's talk about your skill core experiences. Cassie, you've led a ton of trips. Have you actually counted? Do you know the number? I had count at one point, and I think, Rusty, you actually helped me count up at one point. Um, but I know it's over 18. Wow. Yeah. Um, and then we kind of stopped counting at that mm-hmm. point. So yeah, it's been a lot. So Cassie, how has your leadership style evolved over those 18 trips? Uh, I have definitely evolved as a leader. Um, one of the things that we do at orientation for your first trip, um, and I remember my first trip and it was just my team at orientation. There were like five of us and we we're in a small room and orientation has evolved quite a bit, but one of the things we do is kind of explore uh, ideas of something we'd like to be better at in life. And one of the things I said was I'd like to be a leader. Um, I didn't necessarily at the time see myself as a leader. I think I was 24 years old. Um, I I had been very independent in my career in my life, and I never, um, but I'd never played a leadership role really. Um, you know, in work or just in life either. I'd kind of done my own thing. Um, So I really wanted to step into leadership in a way that was to influence and impact the people around me. Um, Little did I know that I was signing up for that uh, 110%. Um, And yeah, I think when I first, when I led my first skill core trip, it was kind of an accident because there was an emergency. The person that was supposed to lead the trip broke her ankle. So I was kind of the first on deck called in. Um, and I think we all kind of wondered if I was ready or not. Uh, mm-hmm. It's kind of a, a big thing to take. I had a huge team as well. I think it was about nine people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was taking them to Indonesia and it was to a center I hadn't been to before. So. Um, a huge piece of my leadership in that trip was faking it um, <laughs> because, and I, and I tell people all the time, you know, um, fake it till you make it. And I do kind of believe that that works in a lot of ways. Cause you kind of have to fake it to yourself and um, just believe that you can do it and, and kind of own the mistakes as they happen, you know, being able to step in and say, Hey, I'm, I'm kind of figuring this out with you. Uh, And I found on that trip how well people responded to that, to just the vulnerability of saying, I'm new to this, I'm figuring this out with you, and asking for feedback throughout. Um, And so I've kind of stayed true to that, even as I can see in a big way that I have evolved as a leader. um, I stay true to those early learnings, which were to go with my gut, you know, talk it out, communicate openly, authentically, honestly with people, um, and not, not decide for them what they think or believe or going to do or respond, but to just put it out there and have real conversations with people. And, um, I've consistently been able to grow and learn based on that approach. Um, because when you're real with people, they're real with you back. And, um, I think that was kind of a, a, stepping stone in my leadership journey through skill core and just having the opportunity to work with, I think Rusty, this was something you helped me with. i had worked with over 50 BCBAs. He kind of helped me tally up who all the people were um, professionally. So I've worked with over 50 BCBAs, like 20 something RBTs, um, 15 or so, uh, teachers, classroom teachers, um, psychologists, social workers, speech and language pathologists. So I've had this opportunity to play a kind of two-week leadership role for such different minds, for such different uh, professionals who come from all different backgrounds, personally and professionally. 
Um, and I think it's just been the perfect container for learning how to be a leader because I've been able to try it on with a new team every, every time. And, um, and see what works. And I've certainly discovered what doesn't work. You know, I've had moments where I go, wow, that was one of my biggest learning moments. And you just have to take it on and be thankful for it, you know, not resist it and, um, and change it next time. So yeah, I have, I've definitely evolved and I've loved that journey. Mm -hmm. You know, I forget that we went to Uganda together. Yeah, that was my first. I was your trip, trip leader for one week. Yeah, Noor Syed was the trip leader for the first week, and it was yep. originally supposed to be an alumni trip, but it, it got extended mm -hmm. to two weeks, so she couldn't do the second week. So you flew in, kind of did the passing of the baton, and yeah. um, that was really cool for me to have you be on that trip because you had such a leadership role in the organization, so you were able to. I think give the team more insight into the workings of the gears and how they turn and everything and why we do this and what to think about and what to look for. And I remember our one-on-one -on -one that we had in the office and you were like, so how do you want to stay involved? <laughs> and I was like, well, maybe <laughs> I want to do Leadership Academy. And I think, you know, having you and Noor too which was a great leader for that trip, but having you guys just motivate us and that, for me for sure motivate me to stay involved and I mean look where we are now so yeah you had no idea you'd get this involved <laughs> <laughs> yeah right awesome. so Rusty you mentioned that you've been to Peru and the Dominican Republic so what was it like for you to travel with the team as a self-advocate it was wonderful and helpful because it got to use my knowledge of the Spanish language. And it's also wonderful because I got to, in addition to not only working, but to do some sightseeing as well. Like in the Dominican Republic, I saw the Chocolate Museum and its old colonial area, and also the tallest waterfall in the Dominican Republic and went horseback riding on its trails. And it was beautiful in the Dominican Republic. Peru, of course, I even got, I got to see a lot of downtown Lima, sunset over the Pacific Ocean, walk, walk near its beaches. Cusco, walk around downtown, see a lot of, listen to Peruvian, Peruvian folk music, enjoy the shops and restaurants, see a lot of llamas. And of course, the tourist train ride that, that was through the jungle, the Peruvian jungle, and got to, of course, traveling, hiking all the way to the top of Machu Picchu and getting my old, you know, all the way to the top to Machu Picchu. It's like I had to really, like, it's like I was, using, I was climbing up like a thousand, like so many steps of stairs in Machu Picchu, like, in terms of, like, it's when people are putting like their whole bodies up high, they think it's like over one mile higher than Denver. And, and to me, I was able to adjust to the altitude because Machu Picchu is definitely among millions of places in the world that are a lot higher than Denver in terms of like feet, mm -hmm. several miles higher than Denver. That sounds amazing. You got to see a lot of stuff and do a lot of cool things. What did you learn about teamwork from those trips? Well, I got to got to know each other very well, and you got to know about their friends and family colleagues. But well, Sarah, I met her husband Joe over Facetime, and Cat, and even I also got to Cat and Michelle and Sarah Costello. I I really got got a chance to know them. Miguel and Katie and Stephanie I got to know see know them very well. And I got to see Stephanie last year before she went on her skill court trip to Kenya mm -hmm. again for a second time. I was really glad good good to see her again because I really enjoyed seeing her in Peru, and I really. I'm also blessed that I got to use my knowledge of the Spanish language during the behavior therapy sessions in Peru and the Dominican Republic. Yeah. And I also, and I feel that I, even though I've had limited experience working with people on the autism spectrum, I want to really work, gain more and more work with people on the autism spectrum because I'm a strong advocate for people with disabilities. And I feel that people with disabilities should be able to be a effective self-advocates in during all time periods, even during times of crises, global pan, like global pandemics, natural disasters, et cetera. Mm -hmm. It's cool that you've been able to keep in touch with some of your teammates and visit them in different places in the country. And it is something really special, like this bond that you have with these people that you travel with for two weeks and you experience all these new things and you're in a completely different environment. And you know, it's 
it's something, I guess it's because it takes a certain kind of person to do these trips and step into that, that that's what brings you guys together. At least that's what I felt with some of my teammates. What do you guys think? I'd say so too. So how did you, like, what bond did you get from your teammates, Rachel? How did you guys uh, feel closely connected? So for example, one memory really comes to my mind. When I was in Kenya with the team, we went to Hell's Gate and we went hiking. And uh, I think just being there together as a team and seeing just the, the vastness of nature, seeing giraffes roaming around, seeing baboons up close and personal, that moment is just so magical that I think it really bonded us together. Also, there are moments of frustration, you know, where things might not go as planned. Like maybe our accommodation doesn't pan out as expect as expected. And we bonded through that struggle too. Wow. I mean, I feel like this really that real this really helped you like stay calm during the struggle and everything like that, right? Did it yeah. help you stay calm and things like that? Yeah. Yeah, well, as the trip leader, I had to, <laughs> you know, I had to model that calmness to make sure everyone else stayed calm. And that's how you got closer together with them. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Cassie, do you have anything to add? Yeah. I mean, I have had a lot of teams um, and I was just kind of running through all the different experiences I've had with each of them. And it's been so different. Every single trip is so different because of the people that are, that are part of your team. Um, and I have been able to form some lifelong relationships with people through this. Um, even my last team, we were a big group. We were, um, it was a lot of, uh, a lot of BCBAs, a lot of, um, you know, there were business owners, there were a lot of leaders, it was kind of a leader heavy team, which, you know, can be a little bit daunting, but we all loved it. We all just loved kind of the strength of the, uh, of the team. And I think early on embraced conflict in a way that was um, just beautiful. We were, we never were hesitant to dig into something deep and to get real and honest about you know, even just the stresses of where to eat dinner, you know, that that can be stressful when mm -hmm. you're on a trip. And, um, you know, you talk about accommodation changes and it's the little things that can end up being the things that really bond you. Um, and I have just had some of the best possible people on my teams. And I think everyone gets the best possible people on their team. And that's how it works is mm -hmm. uh, we do put thought into placing people together as a group. And I think over the years, I've realized just how good we are at that, putting, putting the right strangers into a team together and being able to work together, live together, collaborate together um, across different professions from different backgrounds with different ideas and different personalities. And, uh, we do it for two weeks in a place that none of us have ever been before for the most part, you know, the leader often has been there before, but, um, as well, that proposes its own challenge and that I have to, as a leader, remember that just because I've been to India 10 times, the team I'm with, it's their first experience. So stepping back and being patient and enjoying it with them and kind of putting on those, those new eyes again and, and really applying the practice of appreciation, I think in, in ways that we don't always do in real life. Um, that's something I've gotten from my teammates in the past is just being able to step into their excitement and remember what it's like to experience something new. And, um, I try to keep that mindset and that that practice alive in my work and in my relationships at home, you know, mm -hmm. imagine it being new again and, and really put effort into letting it be new again. Yeah. Rusty, what have you learned about yourself from doing skill core trips? Uh, that I'm really a strong advocate for people on the autism spectrum and that I'm capable of helping the people on the autism spectrum who can't really do much. Like, mm -hmm. like, like, or like, like the people who don't really talk much, I could help them. Yeah, yeah. that's so important. 
Mm -hmm. And you both play roles of community engagement when you're out in the field. So Rusty, could you share some of the advocacy work you've done? I know you mentioned earlier in the conversation about some of the presentations you've done. Could you talk about that? Oh, I, I know in the Dominican Republic, I was doing a presentation about like how I was first diagnosed with autism and like how autism is really helping me develop b bigger and better skills with languages and also how it's helping me like do well in many different areas, help me memorize different things mm -hmm. and also helping me become a bigger and better advocate for other people on the autism spectrum and places throughout the world where they don't really have much services. And I always want to help people and other on the autism spectrum in other parts of the world, especially outside the United States and Canada, where they have hardly any services because I mean, in a lot of, you know, poor and underdeveloped countries, there are, there are a lot of, there are, there are a lot of places that don't even have autism centers, but in developing and, and developed and, in developed countries, they, a lot of them have autism centers. Mm -hmm. So why was it important for you to do that presentation? Oh, just to show how much um, I got involved in, in like outreaching and networking towards all the people in the Dominican Republic on the autism spectrum, helping make sure that the people get all the services they need throughout the country, not just in Santo Domingo, but in the entire country slash island. Mm -hmm. What was it like for you to be in a place where a lot of the locals maybe haven't even met a self-advocate before? It was pretty interesting because they got to know more about how I got involved with Global Autism Project, how I'm grateful for my work, and how I feel that my work's really making a difference for people around the world. Mm -hmm. And you did that presentation in Spanish, right? First, I had to start out with or first, I did it from English to Spanish, but that translated it, yes. Okay, so you did it in both? Yeah, both languages, yes. Wow. So, Rusty, how many languages do you speak? I'd say, I'd say fluently I speak English, Spanish, and Arabic, but I can speak some, some other languages. Like, I'm working, I know a little sign language, I know a little Japanese, a little German, a little Mandarin, a little French, a little... A little bit, little bits and pieces of some African languages like Wolof and Yoruba, some Bahasa Indonesian, some Dutch, and some Czech, a little Russian. But I want to keep working more and more in my languages to, to, to develop bigger and better fluencies because I'd rather keep and gain my fluencies in, in languages than lose them. That's so impressive. Do you take proper lessons or do you just study on your own? Uh, Spanish, I learned it in schools, in school, yeah, in middle school and high school. Arabic, I learned at the NYU School of Continuing Professional Studies. Arabic, it was, a, it was the certificate in the language, and it's right there framed up. It's framed on top of my bookshelf, where I'm not, not on, the, on the area where I'm sitting right now. And it's, I got it six years ago, and, to, and 2012 was when I started, and, and I even got to go on a field trip with my Arabic professor and my classmates to an Arab community in Patterson, New Jersey, and got to see what Arabic markets look like in the Middle East. And, they have a lot of, you know, like water pipes. They have a lot of, um, a lot of like sculptures. They have a lot of signs written up uh, in Arabic all over the place. They have a lot of like musicians. They have people like standing up on ladders, putting decorations in Arabic and things like that. I even got to see my Arabic professor perform at um, Lincoln Center and he played the oud. That's a instrument that's played throughout in Egypt and Syria and throughout most of the Middle East. Yeah, so knowing all these languages is such a huge asset when you travel around the world. Yeah, and I, and I can't wait to travel around the world long after the annoying coronavirus is over and done with. Yeah, we all do. So Cassie, could you tell us some examples of the outreach initiatives you've done while in country? Sure. So... Um, I've helped get speaking engagements uh, put together for the self-advocates that do travel with Skill Corps. So we've had a number of autistic self-advocates travel with us. Um, and it's important for us when they're in country that a role that they get to play is to speak to the community and um, kind of show and invite other self-advocates that, you know, especially in countries where 
there's not a big movement of self-advocacy. There's often kind of a autism is a hidden thing in a lot of the countries we're working in. Um, so making sure that the self-advocates that travel with us get a platform and get a space in that um, in that community to get up and speak. So I've organized a lot of that, helped kind of find the right people, uh, the right places, um, and and then help the center organize the the community to make sure that people are there, um, to make sure that students are there, parents are there, um, news outlets, press conferences, try to get as much kind of awareness around it, make sure that people are showing up not to hear us, Western, you know, service providers speaking, but they're there to hear the voices of the autistic community. Um, and really just kind of emphasize the opportunity for other autistic people in that community to get out and do similar things in the future. Um, other things I've done is work with our partners to develop kind of fundraising initiatives, getting out into the community, uh, even surveys, you know, asking the general public, what, what is autism? Have you heard of this? Do you know anyone in your community that may have autism? Are they getting access to services um, and being able to provide some information back to the people that that are interested that have never heard of it kind of gives us a starting point to see what that community even needs at that point. Should we be talking about services or should we be talking about autism in general because there are kids there are kids and adults in that community who have autism that it's it's gone un unnoticed undiagnosed and um, just trying to work together to make sure that the community can can have some systems in place. Uh, we've worked with doctors um, doing this a similar thing. You know, doctors that are diagnosing in the community oftentimes will give a child a diagnosis and then they don't know what's next. The doctor doesn't even have advice on what's next. Um, so what happens after a diagnosis as far as support and um for, for the person and for the family. Uh, so we've worked quite a bit on that kind of stuff. We've developed uh, fun awareness events, um, again, in places where awareness is still very much key, um, and then kind of shifting that story over the years into an acceptance story as well. So our partners in Kenya, uh, Pooja has done a fantastic job of running a World Autism Awareness Day event in Nairobi. Uh, it started really small, and now it's quite huge. There's tons of people that show up every year for it. Um, and her her kind of marketing and language around it has shifted over the years from awareness of autism to an acceptance story of, you know, it's it's okay. This is not something that needs to be cured. This is not something that needs to be treated. This is something that needs to be um, supported, you know, there needs to be some systems in place to make sure that people with autism in this community can reach their potential. They can be employable. They can be gainfully employed. Um, they can be happily employed. Uh, that's that's kind of the direction that she's heading in now, which is exciting to watch and exciting to know I got to play a small role in that. But that's kind of the uh, the beginning of of the big outreach initiative. Um, and I work with our partners in Indonesia on social media presence um, and really making sure that they are, especially right now, while everyone is just connected online, um, making sure that they're not only advertising that they have a center and that they're providing services, but that they're putting out um, information, resources, free resources, tips, advice um, for the community who maybe can't get to their center or is still just in the learning phase of what does it mean that my child just got this diagnosis. Um, so that's, that's just an example or two, having events in country. Those are some yeah. of the, the fun things. Cool. Yeah. You know, community outreach sometimes sounds like such a daunting task. Like where do you start? You know, and I wonder if maybe we have some listeners who are working in other countries, maybe people who are interested in spreading awareness in their community, where would you say is a good place to start? Yeah, there's two groups of people um, 
there are two groups of people that I think are important to start with uh, when you're, especially in a community where there's very limited understanding of, of autism and what it is. Um, the first group is parents. Um, it's really just, you know, if there's a center that exists, so like with our partners, one of the first things I want to, one of the first goals I want to work on with them before we even go down the social media path, before we go down the path of creating community events is what are your parents feeling? Um, how are they talking to their, you know, if they have a teenager, young adult, how are they talking to their teenager, young adult about their autism? Are they kind of supporting that teenager, young adult? to become a self-advocate? And if not, how do we empower the parents to empower their child to get out into the community and be the self-advocate that that, that community needs? Because um, I think that's a really important key component is to get people with autism talking about autism in mm -hmm. these communities. So it's not just parents and teachers and, you know, people that don't have firsthand experience, no matter, mm -hmm. no matter what I, I don't know what it's like to be a parent of a kid with autism, and I certainly don't know what it's like to be a person with autism. So I think phase one is is finding out where the parents are um, and making sure that, that they're priming their their kids, they're prepping their kids to get out in the world and use their voice in a, in a way that makes an impact. Um, and I think the next step as well, aside from the parent group, is the teachers slash future teachers of that community. So um, doing presentations at universities for people that are studying to become service providers, to become educators, to become psychologists, the people that are going to be working directly with uh, the autistic community in that space, I think is incredibly important, especially early on in their career, um, because they need the type of communication and training and support to understand that their role is, again, not to hide autism, but to empower autism. And if we can kind of focus on the outreach and the language that we're using with those communities that are supporting autistic people um, to be focused on empowering them and preparing them to get out into the world, to use their voice and um, be an example and a model of what's possible with autism in the same way, Rusty, that you do by getting getting out there and speaking multiple languages and sharing your story and showing people what's possible with autism. Um, I think that's that's the future of outreach. Very cool. I'd agree with you, Cassie, because outreach is, and Rachel too, because outreach is really important for individuals on the autism spectrum, especially in in places throughout the world where there are limited services. Yeah, and I think communities are desperate to hear from autistic people. They don't they don't need to hear secondhand accounts from from parents and teachers. I mean, those are helpful in so many different different communities and levels, but I think if we really want to expand the story of what's possible with autism, um which is so much. I have so many friends and colleagues and loved ones who are autistic that are thriving with autism. And that's the story that I think needs to be at the forefront. And all of our outreach efforts need to be focused on ensuring that that story not only remains at the forefront, but can grow and expand. Yeah, for sure. Here's a question from one of our followers on Instagram. Riti05 wants to know, how do you avoid burnout when you're in the field? Rusty, do you have any ideas on this? Well, to avoid burnouts, like go to bed at a reasonable hour. Um, don't spend too much time on social media. And enjoying nature, too, and enjoying, like, rides along the winding roads in those places. And looking at, like, the plantations, like in the Dominican Republic, I enjoyed having hot chocolate on a, on a coconut plantation, chocolate plantation combo. Ooh. Four, four winters ago and are also like looking at ancient ruins like I did in Peru at Machu Picchu and so you focused on really enjoying the excursions yes mm -hmm. Cassie how about you what ways do you avoid burnout when you're on a skill core trip yeah I mean I agree with Rusty completely in that staying off of social media a bit it's important to um 
allow yourself to be present and allow yourself to really appreciate the experience you're having. In the moment, two weeks can feel like forever, uh, but then you open your eyes and it's gone. Um, mm-hmm. So I think really focusing on being present and a couple, there's a couple of ways to do that. And I, I tell all the people I work with, um, you know, some of the best ways to do it is to really unplug for a minute, step away from all the things that are connecting you back to, to home or back to the people that you may be missing back to even work, you know, missing, missing your emails. That's something that can, can really detach you from what's happening and add to your burnout. Um, so stepping away from that and stepping into a space that is full of passion. We talk a little bit about going to your passion station and refilling. Yeah. Um, you will run out of fuel. You're, you'll feel like the most passionate person on the planet when you're on the airplane on your way over there. And then by like day three, you're all out of it. You're <laughs> like, get me home. I'm exhausted. Um, because it does. It uses up. Passion is something that has to be kind of watered and nourished and, and refueled. And you have to kind of revisit those moments that create the passion within you. And for me, in a lot of ways, that means going to sit on the steps at the basketball court at Sorum in India and just kind of watching the adult class play basketball and they all come say hey and give me a high five and just kind of appreciate my being there as a spectator and and um I get to enjoy being a you know their audience the person cheering for them and just being able to do that kind of stuff resets me brings me back to a place of this is why I'm here this is why you know, this morning may have been challenging, but it's all worth it because I know that the little kids are going to grow up into independent adults who are playing basketball with their peers and feel empowered and can go out and get on their own taxi to get home. You know, that's that's what everybody wants at the end of the day. And my bad morning is is contributing to that. And so I get to choose if I want to make it a bad or a a learning moment morning. So I'm um, just going back to that's my advice, I guess, is to find that space that can refuel your passion station and and get into it. Yeah. So thanks for that excellent question, Riti. And just a reminder for our listeners, you can follow us on Instagram at Autism Podcast to stay up to date on future guests and possibly submit a question or topic that you'd like us to discuss. So back to your skill core trips, what was a moment from one of your trips that surprised, inspired, or moved you? A moment on a skill core trip that that surprised me was going swimming underneath the tallest waterfall in the Dominican Republic because I had never gone swimming underneath tall waterfalls before. Wow, what was that like? It was the water was cold, but you know, it was still relaxing from the hot weather. The weather was nice and hot and it was a good escape from the cold weather of New York City. Mm-hmm. And also the thing that really inspired me in Peru was seeing llamas actually at the Machu Picchu in front of the ruins because usually there, because a lot of times during, because in a lot of ancient fortress city ruins throughout the world, there aren't really that many animal, other animal, there aren't really other animals in front of the places besides humans. Peru was an exception to that kind of, was one of many exceptions. So, mm-hmm. That was that was inspiring. Yeah, that sounds like a really special moment. And a carnival festival where Miguel and Stephanie and Katie and I all had water balloon fights. Water balloon fights. That sounds fun. And carnival and carnival and Prue people actually have water balloon fights. Mm-hmm. And there are also there's some people spraying like and there are also people like using the spray guns where they had to, you know. Mm-hmm. With spraying all this decorations all around the place. Cool. Cassie, what about you? Um, I had a moment. There have been, I mean, countless moments that I felt surprised, inspired, and moved. Uh, anytime I'm on the phone with or in the presence of our partners, they're just the best people. Um, but the first time I ever went to... Uh, China. We went for a discovery trip, which was just three days of basically fly out to China, see, meet the potential partner, see if the school is a fit. Um, And it was, it was a huge, beautiful school in Nanchang. 
um, led by this powerful force of a mother, uh, Ms. Chung. And her son is a young adult. He's very independent, uh, autistic young man and uh, works at the school, runs kind of all the errands, basically makes that school run uh, aside from her. And she organized a parent meeting um, where over 100 parents showed up. And she wanted us to kind of introduce ourselves and tell our story. And one of my biggest focuses in outreach, especially when I'm at a partner site and especially a new partner site, is to make sure that um, I am not the central focus of the story, um, to kind of step into the to the back a bit. And I asked Ms. Chung to please step up and tell her story. Uh, and she didn't speak any English, so I had no idea what she was saying. Um, but by the end, she had everyone that didn't speak Eng- uh, Chinese in tears, mm. uh, just with with the magic of her story. And it was just incredibly powerful to watch. And later, I was like, "What? What were you saying?" Like, I could just feel the energy from the from the room of people kind of crying and cheering and feeling so connected to her story. And at the end, I, I asked one of the translators, like, "What was she saying?" And they said that she was explaining for the first time ever that she is a mother of a child with autism. And I thought, Mm. did the parents not not know that? Like, he works here, he's here, and um, they just had never publicly talked about it. And it was a big, huge moment, I think, for, for that community and for the parents to identify with her in that way and for her to be able to say, you know, I started this school because of this. I didn't want you to come here just because I'm a parent. I wanted you to come here because you believe in it. So it's just this really beautiful message. And, you know, for that's not the first time Miss Chung has made, made all of us cry when we have no idea what it is that she's saying. <laughs> There's just something about her delivery. But it was that was a a really amazing moment to be a part of and to watch and to see you know, this is just the beginning of this partnership. We're on like day two with that at that point. And I just got so excited for the, for the future partners that we haven't met yet. And, um, the many Miss Chung's out there in the world that are ready to mobilize their community and ready to really stand up as powerful leaders and advocates in this movement. And, um, and that she's there to be a leader for those people. So it's, it was a beautiful moment. Yeah, right. For them to feel that they're not alone and just supported by each other all together. Yeah. And that any parent can step into that role, you know. By that point she was she had always been praised and seen as this she's had government policy change in China for getting autism services available, getting funding for it. So she was kind of on this pedestal as this great person that did great things for the autistic community, but it wasn't until that moment that I think all the parents realized, oh, she's just a parent as well. Like she started this because she's a parent and then being able to identify, I'm just a parent. What, what can I do here? Like what's possible for me here in this space? Mm -hmm. This is really interesting. Why do you think she chose not to disclose that information from the get go? She told me, cause I was very curious about that. Um, she said she didn't want people to think that the school was less worthy because it was led by a parent. She wanted to be the professional, the teacher that she was. She she had certifications and everything as a teacher, but she said that once people learn you're a parent, that's all they hear. Oh, interesting. Um, and it, yeah, and that she lost, she would have lost her kind of professional clout if she had led with being a parent. So she had waited years before telling them that she was a parent. That's really fascinating. Also looking at like a cultural context of why that's important, that why that was important to her. You know, like in the US, maybe that might be some like the first thing that a parent would say if they're trying to start a business or a group or, you know, it's like, hey, I have skin in the game too. Like you can trust me. Right. Well, I think in China, you know, education is such a high level 
it's so important culturally and you have to have highest quality trained teachers. You have to have the schools need to be led a certain way. They need to be informed in certain ways. And it's just something that they take very seriously. And I think if, if she led by saying, I'm a te- I'm a parent, then it made it almost not as prestigious mm. of a school. Mm-hmm. She wanted to be seen as a prestigious school rather than a parent started something because of love in her heart. Mm-hmm. You know, she wanted it to be about this is business. We're getting work done here. We get quality top notch education at the school and, and they do, they certainly do there. And, um, and now she's, you know, told, told the world that she's a parent, but she waited years and she's been on the news and she's been publicly recognized for the school she started. And all that time, no one knew that she was a parent. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, let's close with one last question. You know, right now it's uncertain when we'll be able to travel again. And a lot of our Skill Corps alumni are kind of itching to get back in the field and see our partners travel again. So, and also we have new Skill Corps members who were supposed to travel this year for the first time who might be feeling disappointed because their trip was postponed. So what advice would you give them to continue advocacy work from where they are? Rusty, do you want to start this one? To continue advocacy work, they could like set up a fundraiser to help donate to save the autism centers because we want them to stay in a the Global Autism Project and all of its international partner sites to stay, stay in existence for very long time periods, even later on into the future. Partner Relief Fund, it's, it, it's, it's like to help our partner sites in like Africa and all, all the places that are affected where there aren't really rem- many remote services. And it's going to help, you know, people around the world could pr- perhaps help people provide remote services and in, in places where they where they, where they can provide easily or to provide remote services in countries where, throughout the world where they can't provide remote services that easily. Mm-hmm. I know, I know, I know everybody here at the Global Autism Project wants to find purposeful things to contribute to society and help other people. Yeah. Right. And just to add that money will go directly to the partners and help pay for some materials or even in some cases rent to keep them afloat during these difficult times. Well, I can times. also help people pay for the rent, not necessarily for the centers, but for to have roofs, roofs over their head at their houses and also for their groceries and their yeah, eventually, support right, because and things if, like that. Because mm-hmm, if the money is going to help pay for therapy and pay the therapists out, then they're using that for their own livelihood. Yeah. And it can help people with their livelihoods and help everybody get help or all the businesses and industries get back up and running again and help us develop a good sense of normalcy and figuring out what the new cultural etiquettes could be because and things among other things. Mm -hmm. I'll post a link to that partner relief fund in case any of our listeners want to donate as well. Cassie, what advice would you give them to continue advocacy work from where they are? Yeah. I mean, I have gone through my own transition of feeling slightly disconnected from the community that I've been so deeply in for for six years now. Um, and some of the things that are helping is listening to this podcast, actually, um, getting to hear from our partners and, and learn a little bit more about, um, just what's happening around the world for everyone. Um, I've gotten a few different ideas and felt inspired by a number of the people you've interviewed, Rachel. Um, there was, there was a podcast episode with um, Crystal and Brandy, and they were talking about um, action you could take to help diversify the field of ABA. And I got so many ideas, wrote it all down, texted Brandy. So mm-hmm. I think um, my advice is kind of to stay engaged and to uh, read the stuff that we are sharing, read the stuff that others are sharing, um, connect with organizations you care about, you know, in addition to the Global Autism Project, if you want to stay involved and get involved with helping our partners, like Rusty said, the first step is is getting involved with the Partner Relief Fund because they are completely dependent on that right now. Um, we're giving 100% of the money raised for that to our partners uh, to pay rent, pay their Wi-Fi, pay for laptops so that they can provide at home services for the kids that can't come into the center. Um, so that's, that's kind of one step. Um, 
And I think those of you that haven't traveled with Skillcore yet uh, may not fully grasp this, but maybe you're starting to get it. Um, we are a community of dreamers and visionaries and and action takers and I think step into whatever role you feel like you could play here and come up with a big idea and dream big and pitch your vision to any of us, you know, put it in the comments on this podcast, go on Instagram, go on Facebook, message us, email us. Um, I think that's something that we never ignore around here. People bring wild ideas to the table and we say, that sounds awesome. <laughs> um, and and I think we run with, with a lot of different things. So I think consume as much as you can uh, with things like this podcast and um, and just kind of sit with what is it that you're passionate about right now? What do you think you could do that would kind of refuel your passion station um, so that you, you're not sitting waiting for your trip for however long you're, you may have to wait, um, but that you can be a part of this community now and you can make the impact you want to make now. Yeah, great. Okay, guys, thank you so much for your time. And I really appreciate your willingness to share your your stories with us oh you're very welcome rachel this was so this was such a wonderful moment thanks for all the great time and effort you put in these i've been listening to some of the older podcasts and they're just really entertaining they can keep me calm during the stressful time and i like podcasts because they can keep me happy and everything and yeah and less and and not stressing out as easily and help me sleep better and things like that and Mm -hmm. really show how much progress we've been really helping. We've been making it in terms of helping out each other. I agree, Rusty. I've been listening to a lot of podcasts, but it has, has definitely helped me stay calm. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. It's been amazing. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being a part of it. Thanks for tuning in to Autism Knows No Borders. At the Global Autism Project, we envision a world where all people with autism can reach their full potential no matter where they live. This includes having access to learning, developing meaningful relationships, and becoming gainfully and happily employed. As Cassie mentioned, the first step in autism outreach and advocacy is crucial. We encourage parents to empower their children and teenagers to become self-advocates in their communities. In order to break stigmas and counter stereotypes, it's essential for first-hand experiences to be heard. Like Rusty, self-advocates can present before college students who will eventually become service providers. Communities can better support their members if they are aware of what their specific needs are. The more autism is talked about and the more it's normalized, the higher the likelihood that individuals with autism will reach their full potential. By educating, training, and inspiring, together we can expand the story of what's possible for people with autism. You've been watching Autism Knows No Borders. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Also, we'd love to hear from you, so let us know what you think in the comment section. Click here to watch another interview from our podcast. You can also find us on your favorite podcast app. Tune in each week for engaging conversations of how people across the globe are inspiring change and building community. Thanks for watching. Take care.